Hi, good morning, Red 15. I'm going to read you chapter 9 from Secret of NIM, and then also chapter 10, and then you're going to go to the Google form and fill out the Google form for chapters 9 and 10. Okay, chapter 9 is called In the Rose Bush. When Mrs. Frisbee got home, Teresa, Martin, and Cynthia were eating supper, as she had told them to do if it got dark before she returned. Coming silently down the tunnel, she could hear them talking in the room below, and she paused a moment to eavesdrop on their conversation. Obviously, Cynthia had been worrying, and Teresa was reassuring her. She couldn't have got back sooner than this, Cindy. Don't you remember? The crow said it was a mile to the tree. It might even be further. Yes, but the crow flies so fast. But what if, but if he went two miles high, that was Martin, it would be three miles altogether. Six, said Teresa, two up, two down, and one to get there and one to get back. That's right. No wonder she isn't back yet. But what about the owl? You know how owls are. It was still light when they got there. He couldn't see. But it's dark now, said Cynthia. Oh, I wish she'd come back. I'm so scared. Not so loud, Teresa said. Timothy will hear. I'm home, called Mrs. Frisbee, hurrying the rest of the way down. Now it appeared that she had been all worried, for they ran to her, and even Martin, who ordinarily avoided such displays, threw his arms around her. Oh, mother, cried Cynthia, new tears with new tears. I was so worried. Poor Cynthia. It's all right. How high did you fly? asked Martin, recovering quickly. High enough so that the trees looked like little bushes, the garden like a postcard, and the river like a snake. Did you see the owl? What did he say? I saw him. Later. I'll tell you about it. First I want to see Timothy. How is he? Why didn't he move? Why didn't you move his bed out here? Teresa said, I wanted to, but he said he'd rather stay in the bedroom. I think he's feeling worse again. But when Mrs. Frizzy went to see him, she found him sitting up, and his forehead felt not at all feverish. I'm all right, he said. I stayed in here because I wanted to think about something. Think about what? About moving day? Moving day? But why? What about it? Had he, after all, overheard her talking to the others? Heard about her flight to the owl? But no, he was explaining. I haven't been outdoors since I got sick, so I don't know what it's like. I mean, the weather. But today, this afternoon, I noticed something. What was that? A smell in the air, a warm, wet smell. If you sniff, you could still smell it, but it's not as strong now. Mrs. Frisbee had noticed this, of course, both indoors and outside, or outdoors. It's the smell of the frost melting, Timothy went on. I remember it from last year, and after that, it wasn't long until we moved. Mother, when are we going to have to move this year? Oh, not for a long time yet, Mrs. Frisbee tried to sound as casual as she could. It's still much too cold, too early to think about it. I have to think about it, said Timothy. He sounded serious, but calm and unworried. Because if it comes too soon, I don't know if I can go. I tried walking a bit today in here when the others were outside. Timothy, you're supposed to stay in bed. You'll make yourself sick again. I know, I know. I, but I, didn't, but I had to find out, and I didn't walk much. I couldn't. I only went a few steps, and I got so dizzy I had to lie down again. Of course you did. You haven't really recovered yet. I guess I haven't. But that's what I wanted to think. That's why I wanted to think. Timothy, you must not worry about it. That will only make you worse. I'm not worried at all. I thought I would be, but I'm not. Or maybe I think I should be, but I can't. What I really think about is how nice it is out there in the summer beside the brook, and it's true, I want to go there. But I'm not scared. I was afraid you might be, or that you think might think that I was. That really, I just wanted to tell you. I'm just going to wait and see what happens, so you shouldn't worry about it either. Mrs. Frisbee realized that he had somehow switched their positions. He had seen the danger he was in, guessed somehow that moving day was near, and he was very likely to die. And yet here he was, reassuring her. She wanted to tell him about the owl and the rats, tell him that something still might be done, but she decided she had better not. She really did not, she really, she did not really know if, she, if they would help. It would be better to wait to see until she had seen them. So instead, rather lamely, she said, Timothy, don't think about it anymore. When the time comes, we'll see how you are, and then we'll decide what to do. The next morning at daybreak, she went to see the rats. She had never been in the rosebush before, never even really been close to it, and now the nearer she got, the more nervous she became. No one had ever told her, nor, as far as she knew, told any of the other animals to keep away from it. It was just something one knew. The rats on Mr. Fitzgibbon's farms kept to themselves. One did not prowl in their domain. She had, before coming out of the garden, looked around carefully to be sure Dragon was nowhere in sight. But even Dragon, though he would chase a rat up to the edge of the bush, would not follow him into it. The thorns, of course, helped to discourage, trust, discourage trespassers. Mrs. Frisbee had never realized, until that moment, standing next to it, 
how very big the bush was, how dense, how incredibly thorny. It was bigger than a tractor shed, and its branches were so densely intertwined that as small as she was, Mrs. Frisbee could find no easy way to crawl through it, though she walked all the way around it looking. She remembered approximately where she had seen the rats go in, and she studied that part of the bush carefully. How had they done it? Then she saw that on one branch, close to the ground, the thorns had been scraped off, and about a half inch of it, just big enough for a handhold, was worn smooth. She put her hand on this and pushed timidly. The branch yielded easily, rather like a swinging door, and before, behind it she saw a trail, a sort of tunnel through the bush, wide enough so that she could walk into it without touching thorns on either side. When she went forward, she released the branch, and it swung back silently into place behind her. She, went, she was inside the bush, and it was dark. She walked forward, peering into the dimness and following the small trail, which wound in a curving course toward the center of the bush, its earthen floor packed firm from the pressure of small feet. Then, straight ahead of her, she saw the entrance. She had expected, what, a round hole in the dirt, most likely? But certainly nothing like she saw. First, a sizable clearing, about five feet across, had been cut from the center of the bush. Branches overhead had been clear away, too, not quite to the top of the bush, but almost, so that the sunlight filtered through easily and soft moss grew on the ground. In the middle of this bright green cave rose a small mound, eight inches tall, in the end of which was an arched entrance nearly neatly lined with stone, like a small doorway without any door. Behind the entrance, its floor was li also lined with stones, led backward and downward. Beside the entranceway, looking at her with dark, unblinking eyes, stood the biggest rat she had ever seen. Dun, dun, dun. All right, so go ahead and watch the next uh, chapter and then fill out the Google form.